Hey patrons, thank you so much for all the continued support. It means a lot to me. And I am done. Okay, so I just got finished reading The Sunlit Man. This is secret project number four by Brandon Sanderson. And I want to give you my unedited thoughts upon finishing this book, which was literally just right now. So this book rocks, everybody. Uh, this is everything that I could have dreamed of when I first heard about these secret projects. Uh, and I legitimately think this is like the best Brandon Sanderson book since Rhythm of War back at the tail end of 2020. So three years. Um, so to back up a little bit for the two of you watching this who don't know, uh, but last year Brandon Sanderson announced that he had secretly written four books uh, that he would release quarterly in 2023 via Kickstarter. And he became by far the most uh, popular and successful Kickstarter of all time, uh, raising far more money than the number two best Kickstarter ever, uh, which is so awesome that a fantasy author was able to pull that off. That just warms my heart. Um, but my impression of these Kickstarters before this uh, book had been mixed. Now, I absolutely loved Trust of the Emerald Sea. I gave it a five stars. Um, I thought that uh, Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England was just kind of so-so. Um, and I thought that Yumi and the Nightmare Painter was written for, really just like written for a different audience uh, than me. And I didn't really like it very much. But this book, this book beats them all, uh, and it makes me very happy uh, with the secret projects overall. And more than that, it really does restore my faith in the direction that Sanderson is now taking these books. Um, so I've, I've been a Sanderson fan for a really long time, and I've always loved the way that he writes his books. Um, and I consider him one of my favorite authors. Um, but I've had a lot of problems lately with the direction uh, of the Cosmere in general. And the Cosmere is what he calls, like... The way almost all of his books are kind of interconnected. Think like Marvel Cinematic Universe and the way those books kind of, they have like some standalones, they have their own thing, but they all kind of connect together. Um, and he's trying to do that in fantasy form, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I've had a problem uh, because what it started out as were these like subtle little Easter eggs in the books. Um, and now there's this overarching narrative um, that it, it kind of is in your face in a lot of these books. And it makes you have to read a lot of other books uh, without having to read these. And, and while I do like Marvel, um, and I honestly do think that the Cosmere going in, in that direction could be a good thing, um, I haven't really loved how things like Mr. Ornera 2 handled that direction. I mean, I was concerned that this path was the new way. Uh, maybe it still is. Uh, but this book really switched up things in an amazingly positive way for me. Um, so before we go into those tie-ins specifically, let's take a moment to kind of slow down and talk about this book on its own. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the setting of this book and the world building because honestly for me it's like Stormlight level amazing and I, I play Stormlight in like the highest of the high in terms of the quality of the world building there. But basically, and I'm going to try my best to explain this, uh, but there's a lot of complexity here and I might mess things up, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, so this book takes place far into the future in what feels like uh, is the Cosmere like space age. Um, you know, it's really common for people to be able to jump between planets, either using um, a kind of secret power that some people have that I don't want to go into too much detail because it kind of will ruin some things from another book. But also it's seemingly using spacecraft to do traditional kind of space travel. Um, this planet that this book takes place on is an extremely small planet and it spins rather slowly. Um, the star that the planet is orbiting around is so close to this planet that it emits so much heat that, that if you step into the sunlight even a little bit, uh, you'll die instantly. You'll just melt. Uh, but the sunlight also contains investiture. Um, and if you don't aren't familiar with that term and you're not familiar with like Sanderson books, think like mana from like video games, you know, the thing that powers magic. Um, the sun is, uh, is like reflected by the plan. I think like the planetary rings so that they do have daylight, but when the sun rises fully and it's directly hitting, um, hitting the populace, they'll just instantly die. So they have to constantly be moving ahead of the sunlight uh, via like hover bikes and these airships. And they have to go as fast or faster uh, than, than the sun goes. But they can't go too fast because then they'll wrap around uh, this planet and, and they'll get fried. So they have to stay in kind of this medium place. Uh, there's really cool concepts where um, when the sun is reflected by these rings that it will like, it, 
has so much power that it will instantly grow crops like really, really, really quickly. So they'll kind of hang back, grow their crops so they can eat. Um, it's a really cool, fun concept. Now, there's two main factions in this book. Uh, one is led by this guy called the Cinder King, who is extremely powerful and essentially just evil. Um, and there's this other faction that's trying to stay away from the Cinder King. Uh, when the Cinder King catches people, uh, he'll either uh, do this horrible thing where he'll chain them up uh, and make them get burned to death uh, when the sun comes around again. And when he comes around again with his people, that they'll collect the remnants that they left behind. Um, and they became these, like, uh, these... Uh, ember shards i forgot the name exactly uh but they'll that's what you, they use to use for fuel for their ships um or he'll turn them into these mindless drones that obey his every will that are really violent it's like essentially his slaves now when you mix this all together um, what you're left with due to the fact that everyone has to stay on the move is by far the fastest paced brandon sanderson book by a long shot it feels like this book never really lets up off the gas it's such a wonderful change of pace uh, from, like, the normal Sanderson technique of, like, easy, easing you in slowly into the world and the story that he seemingly does in every other story besides this one. Uh, the protagonist of the story is a character that you already know if you've read some of these other books. I don't want to ruin anything else from you or even tell you what book that this character is, is from because it is fun to kind of unravel that mystery as you go along. Uh, but if you've read some of the books that this character is relevant in, you'll get it within the first, you know, 50 or so pages. Um, but this character is essentially playing the this lone wanderer type role. Kind of think like an old Clint Eastwood type of character from like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly or something. Or like any classic Western where this hero shows up. Uh, they have to save the local population. And then they walk off into the sunset when it's over um, and their job is done. Now, I happen to love old Westerns. Uh, I've never really gotten into Western books. Uh, a little bit, but not that much. But I love old Western movies. Um, so to read like the fantasy literary version of the Western movies that I've grown up watching and loving was a really awesome treat for me. Um, now, there's the usual Sanderson twists, uh, the, like these twists and turns, uh, not just with the plot, but with what we know about the magic and the world itself. Um, and it's all ties together with this awesome epic final showdown, uh, what a lot of uh, fans of Sanderson affectionately call the Sanderlanch, uh, that we everyone's come to expect uh, and love from Brandon Sanderson. So earlier in this review, I talked about why the Cosmere tie-ins here work so much better for me uh, than in some of his other books, namely the fourth book in Mistborn Era 2, The Lost Metal, which I did not like. Um, and I think it will be hard to explain without really like planning this review out, which I don't do, uh, but I'm going to do my best. So I think that I love this version of the way that the Cosmere tie-ins work for two big reasons. So the first um, is that in The Lost Metal, we got this book that is so heavily dependent on like intense Cosmere knowledge across multiple different series that it almost made me feel like you have to be de like devoted yourself to the Cosmere lore to be able to appreciate that book. Um, and while I am one of those people, um, I, I also literally read hundreds of other fantasy books, and I just can't remember things to that level. And if in the past, I might have been able to do this when I only read a few series and it really stuck in my brain. Uh, but Maybe I'm just not smart enough, but I just can't remember that intricate level of detail. So many of the things in, in something like The Lost Metal just kind of went over my head, and it felt overly done. Uh, but in this book, you only need kind of a loose knowledge of some of the books to be able to get 95% of what's going on. Um, I think, honestly, if you just read the first two Stormlight books, you're good to go. Um, even if, uh, like you can do some extra reading, like there's going to be some Mistborn references in there. Uh, there's references for one of the short stories. I think it's like shadows for silence or something like that. Um, and that'll give you more background. Um, but it's been about three years now since I no over three years now since I read the second Stormlight book. And I feel like I, I got virtually everything that I needed to know. It's still stuck in my brain. That's the right way to do Cosmere tie-ins. Go ahead and make them prevalent, but don't lock people out from enjoying the content if they haven't reread the books recently. Now, I think that's what Marvel does really nicely, is that you can watch a lot of those movies independently without having to watch all the other ones. It helps if you have, but it's not like crucially important. Now, some of them are, but it works better in movies because it's not hard to say, oh, let me refresh myself on what happened in this other movie. I'll go spend two and a half hours and go watch that. Where in the books, if you were going to be like, oh, let me just go read Rhythm of War real quick. Okay, I'll see you in 30 hours. 
it's not the same thing. Uh, and it, you know, I get what Sanderson is going for, um, but this is the way to do it. And I hope this is the way that it goes forward in the future. I think the second reason that these Cosmere tie-ins work so well for me is because this was a standalone book. You don't have to read this to appreciate the other books, or at least I don't think you will. Um, this really just feels like fan service. Um, it doesn't really need to be written, but thankfully it was. I love that. Uh, it worked really, really well in this instance. Um, so overall, um, I would recommend this book to quite literally everybody that likes the Cosmere, um, which I feel like nowadays is almost every fantasy reader, right? Everyone's read Sanderson. Uh, it's a wonderful edition. And honestly, I think uh, it's not hyperbole for me to say that I think this is one of Sanderson's better books. And it's hands down my favorite secret project book, even over Trust of the Emerald Sea. Um, over Yumi, which uh, oh, I felt like everybody loved but me, because um, it was just kind of doing this thing that it wasn't it wasn't for me. Um, and ultimately, I kind of think this might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion. My guess is that most people are going to say, I liked it, didn't love it. Um, probably going to see a lot of four stars for this book. Um, but you know, and, and I'm confident almost everybody's going to say they like Tress more. Uh, maybe Yumi. I don't think anybody in the world is going to say that they liked um, the Frugal Wizard more. Um, I just haven't heard that opinion from anybody. Maybe there's people out there. I just don't know who they are. Um, but honestly, this book stands up with some of the huge epic books that Sanderson has written in the past. Things like Stormlight. Not quite to that level, but honestly, this is wonderful. I love it, and I'm so happy that I got the chance to read this. And I know you're not watching this, uh, Brandon Sanderson, but thank you uh, for writing this book. I feel like I, I, in this book, um, I think in the after part of the book, um, it, it's going to mention it because in the, there's always like this after thing. I didn't read it here, but in all the other ones it was. But I think I remember him saying earlier in one of the other books that, you know, the first book and I think the third book were written for his wife. I don't remember who the second book was for, but I, I knew that the fourth book was going to be written for the fans, and I felt that on this one. I really did. So that is it for me. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, happy reading to you. Thanks again to all my patrons with a special shout out to my Ascendant tier and Librarian tier patrons, Anna G, CJ, Darren, Gregory, Jonathan, My Book is Lit, Nathan T, Nev's Book Channel, Orthodoxia, Ron Reich, Russell, Ryan L, Sydney Baker, Tahir, Anna, Andra, Angelo, Blair, Brock, Evan, Harry B, Joe, Kat Mick, Maria, Michael Sugarman, Sky, TW57, Wacky, and Zion. Thanks for sticking to the end of this video, and if you want to watch some more content from my channel, click over here and I've got some good videos for you. Thanks so much.